Good evening. Welcome. We're going to go ahead and start on time because I don't know what genius scheduled this on opening night. Might have been me. Anyways, we're going to go ahead and get started so that we can get you all of the information that you need to help your senior through the admissions process and then hopefully get you to kick off time, all right? But before um, guidance starts the presentation, I'm gonna, I'd am gonna i like to um, welcome Jackie Barnes. Jackie um, has taken over as the APTO president for Eileen Cozzolino, and I think she's realizing just what that entails. Yes, so welcome Jackie. We look forward to working with you, and we greatly appreciate the support of the APTO. Greetings and good evening, and uh, congratulations on making it to this point. I know it's exciting and scary and stressful and wonderful, so I hope you can just sit back and relax and get some great information. And uh, I just, uh, you're probably wondering what the heck is a PTO doing at this meeting? I thought we were done. Um, but just real quick, um, one word, scholarship. Uh, one of the big things that the APTO does is offer scholarships to deserving students, and we have done that in the past. So we wanted to remind you guys of that opportunity, and you'll be getting a lot more information February, Marchish, I understand. Um, and there, there'll be a lot more detail available to you, but please keep that in mind. And one of the things that membership dues covers is the scholarships that we provide. In addition to um, supporting the junior post-prom party, uh, field trips, um, and guest speakers, uh, hospitality, there's a lot of things the APT APTO does behind the scenes. But you may not be a member now, you might be thinking it's the last year, but it's very important if you're interested in the scholarship opportunities that you're a member by January 1. Um, so if there's any question, please feel free to um, check into that. We have a table and forms in the, uh, outside the auditorium as you're walking out. Uh, if you haven't signed up, you certainly can. Uh, it's a good time to do it. And uh, don't forget there are legacies too. This is a family membership and you may have someone coming up right behind your senior or already here. So uh, please consider us. Good luck to all of you and go Pats. All right, thank you, Jackie. So good, good evening, my name is Lisa Connery. I'm the Director of Guidance here at Algonquin. Um, before we get started, um, I'd like to just take a minute to um, introduce the counselors who will be working very closely with your students this fall. I can't say enough for the work that the counselors do with students, you know, kind of meeting them where they're at. Um, they do I, just fantastic work and I'm just so grateful to have such a great um, you know, staff in the guidance office. So we have um, here, beginning with Pam Mackey. Next to her is Kate Mulcahy. I think it's always nice to be able to put a face with a name. We have Becca Haberman. She's gonna jump up and down so we can see her, huh, Beck? Uh, it's under, don't worry. It's here for you, Becca. We're here for you. Andrea, we have next to Becca, we have Andrea Hotchkin. Then we have Jason Lassard, Connor Brosnan and Dave Breglio. So these are the wonderful counselors who are gonna work very hard to assist you and your student through the admissions process. So while I was standing up in the back with Dana, our lovely um, cable access record, um, employee who's recording this event for us, thank you Dana, I was listening to some of the parents as they walked in and I was hearing, how are you? Oh, stressed. How are you? Oh, we're so behind, right? <laughs> So I was just standing there and already I heard, you know, um, that people are feeling a little stressed, feeling a little bit behind. And we're here to, I'm here to tell you that we really have this mapped out. And, you know, a couple long weekends, a few hours here and there, and you can easily get caught back up, okay? The counselors do a wonderful job mapping this process out and guiding your student through this. We've been meeting with the students this week in workshops, and we've been going over you know, kind of the nuts and bolts of the college admissions process. We reviewed some of the things that we've discussed in the spring, and now what we're doing is helping students to understand how do we pull all of these pieces together? You know, how do we go and request a teacher recommendation? How do we submit recommendations? How do we request transcripts? What about that guidance counselor rec? 
Next week, we're going to be meeting with students again, and we're going to be going over kind of the nuts and bolts of the Common App. And we have an entire um, tip sheet that we provide to the students that kind of walks them through completing their application. So we actually get the students on. We share information with them, similar to what is in your workbooks, um, and that we'll share with you tonight. And then we actually get them on the computers, and we help guide them through the process. So we did that all this week, and we will do, be doing that again next week. So one of the things that we'll be doing is we'll be updating GPA. So that will happen in like a week or so. We, do, we did update it at the end of junior year. Of course, there are some grades changes that have occurred. There might be an incomplete grade for a student who left before they took a final. So we're going to clean up some of those grades, and we will recalculate the GPA. At that time, we will also you know, um, recalculate rank. So in about a week or so, we will publish in Naviance the updated GPA and class rank for this class. That will be the GPA and the class rank that we will be submitting to the colleges. That will include final grades for every course that they've taken here at Algonquin in grades 9, 10, and 11. We will not recalculate the GPA again until the end of senior year. However, what we do do, and we're sharing this with the students as we're um, doing our workshops and meeting with them individually, we do send out term one grades, and depending on how a student is applying to a college, we submit term two grades. Okay, so we're encouraging the students, they have to stay focused. They have to stay on task. They have to continue to perform at or above where they've been performing, you know, all along in high school. Okay, so while we don't recalculate the GPA, we do send report cards and the colleges will factor that into their overall decision. We'll send out an email once the GPA has been um, updated. We're also going to be offering another college fair coming Monday, September 18th. We have like over 100 schools um, that are coming and you know from 6 to 7.30 at night I, we would welcome you to bring your student in to you know talk with some of the reps for the schools that they're interested in. We also have shown the students how we are having admissions reps um, visits in the CRC. I know one of the counselors is going to pull that up in Naviance and go over that but we also have a lot of colleges who are coming in for individual um, presentations for students. We're going to have a financial aid night. That's a big one for everybody. Now that your students done all of this hard work, it's time to figure out, oh, how are we going to pay for this? So we bring in a MIFA rep um, to talk specifically with parents. And I know one of the counselors, I think it is Kate, is also going to give you a brief overview of financial aid. But I would encourage you to come to the financial aid night because at that time, you will get much more in-depth information regarding financial aid. And there'll be an opportunity for you to be able to ask some questions of that financial aid rep as well. One thing that I did forget to mention when we first started is we do have a couple interpreters in the back um, of the room, and I just wanted to let everybody know that, you know, they're there, they're not just holding a conversation <laughs> amongst themselves, but we do have a couple interpreters in the back of the room, okay? Um, all right, so one other thing that I would like to talk about, um, a couple of the counselors are going to be reviewing the common application um, during this presentation. The common app has created a new component, and it is called the advisor link. And so what this does is this allows students to go ahead and put their advisor's information in, and that gives, so like their counselor, that gives the counselor access to the students to review the student's application, okay? So you put, and it sends the counselor an email. So as a department, we have talked about this. And, you know, we can see the kids, the kids are very tech oriented, and we can see them putting our email address in there, sending us an email, and that's kind of the end of the discussion. They just assume that, you know, we're reviewing their application. So as a department, how we would like to handle this is we're going to handle that the same way that we have for years. And that is, if a student would like us to sit down and review their application, then we ask that they set up an appointment with us. That they come down, we have them open up their Common App, we do this all the time, and we walk through the application with them. There's a lot of personal information in there that even if we were to review it, we couldn't even begin to know if it's accurate. You know, So we like to sit with the students, 
and walk through things and answer their questions. So we're going to ask students that if they would like to meet with us to review their application that they have to set up in an appointment. Schedule an appointment with us, we're happy to do that versus just sending, you know, putting us as their advisor and sending us a link. And when the counselors are going through the Common App, they're actually, they'll, they'll pull that part of the Common App up and just kind of go back over that. But I just wanted to make sure that, you know, parents and students were aware that if they want us to review the application that they do need to set up a, an appointment with us, okay? Well, we will go over that when the counselors will go over all that, okay? So we'll kind of walk you through how to, um, how to uh, request a counselor rec and teacher rec and stuff like that. Okay, so we're gonna go over all that as we work through the presentation. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to the counselors and I think Andrea Hodgkin's gonna start with testing and then we'll take questions at the end, okay? No, I'm good with this. You guys hear me? All right. <laughs> All right, um, we're usually using a microphone, like a wireless one. This is good. All right, so I am talking about testing. We have been talking about this for a long time with the students, starting in January of junior year. We had talked to them about taking SATs and ACTs, possibly taking SAT subject tests. So at this point, I'm not talking about what those are because that's in the past. Now what we need to talk about is how do we get those test scores to the colleges. So time and time again, students are just assuming that we send test scores. We do not send test scores. In order for any college to consider a test score official, it has to be sent directly from the testing company. So that would either be through College Board or through ACT. So it is the student's responsibility to have that sent and I'll go through a little bit about how they go about doing that um, but I would say 90% of the time when students come back and they say I got a message my application is incomplete when we look at that it's because they forgot to send the test scores okay so I just can't emphasize that enough that it is the students responsibility to go through their College Board account or ACT to have those scores sent Okay, so when to, tend, when to send the scores, if you go to page two of your workbook, we actually divided, uh, we have two different timelines there about when scores should be sent. So one is for students who are applying early action or early decision, so those deadlines usually start around November 1st. And then we have another timeline for uh, students who are applying regular decision. Okay, so for students applying early, and if they are taking those October exams, they should request that their scores be sent to their chosen schools at the time that they register. This way, the scores will be received on time. If the student already registered for the exam but didn't put their um, colleges in, that's fine. They can go back in and request to have those scores sent to the colleges. As soon as those scores are released then, the college, either College Board or ACT will send those automatically to the college as long as the student had made that request. So for students taking the November exam, and if they are planning on applying early, they should be checking with their colleges to see if they will accept those scores a little later. Because the October SAT, those scores will be ready for November 1st. The November SAT, those scores won't be ready until later in November. So colleges have their own policies, how they handle this. Many colleges say that that's fine, they'll wait. Other colleges may say they'll make a decision before they see those November scores. So that's where you gotta check with each college to see if that's okay. So if students are all done with testing and they have no more tests to take, but they're applying early, or even if they're applying regular, they will need to go back into their account at this point and pay to have their test score sent to each college. All right, so also we look then at those regular decisions. So those typically start in January, okay? We will have students taking October tests for that, November, um, even later. And we would ask, even if they're applying later, but if they already know which schools they want those scores sent to, put them on their list when they uh, register. Students do get four free score reports with their registration. Okay, that's both for ACT and SAT. 
Those are registration credits. They disappear if they're not used during registration. Okay, so it's part of the registration process. So that means by the time you register to a week after you take the exam, you can go onto the College Board or ACT account, say, I want my score sent to these four schools. Those will be free. After that, College Board does charge $12 per test, um, per score, as you said. All right, so in terms of how this is all done, Basically, I keep saying you go to those accounts, you do. When you go on to College Board or ACT, there will be a link, and it just says send scores, and you go through that process of designating which schools and then paying for that. On page three of your workbook, we do list the fall testing dates. So you can see, actually tomorrow is the deadline for students who do want to take the October SAT. So tomorrow's the regular deadline. After that, there is a late registration with an extra fee for that. So I know this is a lot of information to process. Um, feel free to ask uh, your child's gu guidance counselor specific questions about the testing for, their, for your own child. I'm gonna hand the mic over to Connor Brosnan, and he's gonna go talk about how to request transcripts. So I'm going to talk about some of the kind of official things that need to happen in order to send out transcripts and officially apply to college. Um, so last year we were using Naviance, I'm sure most of you have been on Naviance a number of times, to research schools, look at the graphs, see what kind of majors they offer. We now use Naviance to actually apply to college. So the application is not through Naviance, but we send transcripts and recommendations through Naviance. So the first thing we actually had the students do when we were uh, working with them this week is match up their Common App account, which if you guys don't remember what the Common App account is, that's the Common Application. Um, it's an application that's accepted by the majority, not all colleges, but a lot accept it. Um, so we always tell students if you have five colleges and three accept the Common App, use the Common App. If you have two colleges that accept the Common App, use the Common App. So the first thing we had them do is match their two accounts, and that's just so they can talk to each other in order to send rec recommendations and send transcripts. Um, if you go to the College I'm Applying To link, you will see right there under, so if you actually go down, so right there it says Common App Account Matching. That means that your student actually matched their account already. Um, as part of that process, in order to match their account, they had to fill out what is called the FERPA waiver. Um, FERPA, I actually had to look it up. It stands for the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And basically what this does, it number one allows us to send the records, the transcripts to the colleges they apply to. And the number two kind of, of, of most interest to the students is it waives their right to read recommendations. Um, they have the choice to not waive their right, but we highly, highly recommend that they waive that right. Um, the reason for that is, number one, colleges see whether or not they waive their right to read the recommendations before they're sent. And number two is, obviously, at college, if they know that the, the, t the student's going to read the teacher recommendation and the guidance rec recommendation, generally the teacher or the guidance counselor might write a little differently knowing that the student's going to read that recommendation. Um, so we ask that the students really trust the recommenders, trust the counselor, trust the teacher. Um, we only write good things about your children, I promise. The teachers would not agree to write it if they didn't feel they could write a good recommendation. Um, so as long as you go on and it says common app account matching, that part's done. All right. So in order to officially request transcripts through Naviance, it's a fairly easy process. Um, sometimes it's too easy. Kids add about 100 colleges that they're not really going to apply to. So we ask they only do this for colleges they're definitely applying to. If they're not sure right now, leave it off the list. So what they're going to do is if they actually go into the colleges I'm thinking about, um, this is the list they've kind of been building throughout the past year or so. Um, I'm guessing this list has shrunk and grow. Um, a lot of students I've talked to, their list isn't finalized yet, which is totally fine, but they might have, you know, four, five, six schools that they're really sure they're going to apply to. Those are the schools you want to move into the other list. So what you're going to do is you're going to click off on the left there. So say we're going to do definitely apply to American, Bridgewater, Endicott, and UMass. And you're just going to do move to application list at the bottom. Now, once you do this, a new window will pop up. Um, in this window, there's a couple different things I just want to point out. On the left side, it says type. This means how you're applying. Um, when you click the drop down, you'll see all these different options pop up. 
So just because American University has rolling and priority and early decision one and two listed there doesn't mean that they offer those. This is just a default for every college. So this is where your student really has to do their research and know what types of applications that college accepts, what kind of deadlines they have. So say we're just gonna do regular decision for American, we know they have regular decision. Um, and as you go through, you know, Bridgewater, maybe you're gonna do early action there. Endicott, you wanna do regular, and maybe UMass, early action. Um, to the right of that, under transcript, we just ask that they check off those boxes. That's just to ensure that we can actually send the transcripts to those colleges. And then you're gonna go to add applications. So the next screen that pops up, this is actually a screen where they, some colleges accept either the Common App or their own individual application. Some colleges only accept the Common App, some colleges only accept their own application. So if they offer either, we ask that they go through and actually choose which one they're gonna use. Again, we highly suggest that the students just use the Common App. Um, there's no reason to do another application if you don't have to. And then we do update applications again. And now we're in the Colleges I'm Applying To link. Um, so actually, if you look at this, um, this is gonna be the schools that we're sending transcripts to, that recommendations are going to. A um, Couple of things on here, I just wanna point out real quick, under the type, that should be how you're applying, so regular decision, early action, et cetera. Um, how are you applying? That's are you using the Common App or their own application? If it's blue, that means you can change it from either Common App to their own application. Um, if there's an unknown there, you wanna make sure you go in and fix that. Submission type. Um, we went over this last year, but just briefly to go over it again. Uh, the CA with a computer screen means they take the common application. The computer screen means they just have their own application. Every now and then you'll see one with a stamp. Um, there aren't many of those anymore. That means that we will talk to your student about that. Don't worry about it. Um, there aren't many. <laughs> um, the deadlines pop up. You'll see if there's no deadline, that means one or two things. Either that is a rolling admission school where they really don't care when you send it in. As you send in their application, your application, they'll make a decision. Or you selected the wrong option possibly um, and they don't offer regular decision or early action or early decision. So again, you wanna go back in, make sure you're applying the proper way, the right deadline. Um, when you look at the transcripts, it says requested. Um, if there was no request, it would say none and it would be in red. Um, you'd wanna go back in and make sure you request those transcripts. Um, if you need to edit anything, you're gonna click on the pencil there. So if they ch decide that they wanna apply early action somewhere instead of regular decision, they can do it that way. Um, if they wanna use the common app, initially they said they didn't, they can go back in there and fix that. Um, so again, the really important piece with this is that they're only putting colleges that they're definitely applying to. Every year I have a kid that puts in 30 schools, I send transcripts and recommendations to all the schools, and they apply to three of them. Um, so save, save your student the headache, only add schools that you're definitely applying to. You can always add more as you go through the process. Um, one last thing with this, as you are going through, um, the first four transcripts are free. Um, after that is $3 a transcript. Um, you just pay that money right to Ms. Terry, the guidance secretary in the guidance department. They can pay it whenever they want. Um, we suggest they do it right away so they don't have to forget about it or don't worry about it later on. Um, and that's pretty much it when it comes to this. So now I think Ms. Mackey, Pam's gonna come up and talk about recommendations. Hey everybody. Um, so my name's Pam Mackey and I'm gonna chat briefly about teacher recommendations, counselor recommendations, and then I'm gonna jump into admissions counselors visits. So I'll be talking about kind of the rest of what you're gonna be using Naviance for. Um, so last May we had a workshop with the students and at that time we encouraged them to contact a teacher, identify a teacher to write their college recommendation. Um, we talked to the kids about, you know, don't go for your best grade, go for the teacher that really knows you personally the best. Um, so the majority of the students have already talked to teachers about recommendations and they would have done so in May or June of last year. We talked to kids today and we have one more workshop tomorrow and we'll be letting them know that if they have not talked to a teacher yet that they need to see us and we can help them identify somebody who can write them a recommendation. So what we're doing is we're encouraging kids since last, a lot of them talked to them last year to touch base with their teacher this year. After the students have spoken with a the teacher, they should fill out the teacher recommendation form. So on the homepage of Naviance, under the document library, 
there's a whole bunch of forms. It's pretty much everything I'm about to talk about. So under there, you're going to see um, the teacher recommendation form. There's a counselor recommendation form, a parent brag sheet that I'll talk about in a minute, and also the college rep pass. So this is kind of all your documents in one kind of specific location for you and your student to fill out. So once the students talk to the teacher, they'll need to formally invite them to upload their letter through Naviance. To request a teacher, you're going to go to the Colleges I'm Applying To list, and you're going to click on the Letters of Recommendation section. OK, then you're going to go to Add Request, and the student's going to select a teacher from the drop-down menu. We're suggesting that students choose specific colleges. That way they can select the college they want the teacher's letter to go to. And then we're asking the kids to enter a personal note. So, hey, Mr. Allaire, thank you very much for writing my recommendation. Uh, my first deadline is November 1st. Um, I will follow up with you again to talk about the form. Um, when the students have completed the form, and you guys can check out the form, it's on there, basically asks what they enjoyed about the course, um, what their favorite project was, why they're asking the teacher for the letter. Um, we're having the students meet with the teachers in person, so we're asking them not to just drop it off on their desk, um, but to actually print out a copy and then bring that to the teacher with any other information that the teacher requests. All right, cool. Um, so we're also going to be writing letters of recommendation. Uh, we write about 50 a year, and we spend a lot of time on these guys. We take these really, really seriously. We're excited to write glowing recommendations about all the wonderful things that we've done with your students. We've known them since freshman year. Um, so we're asking them to do some more information for us also. Um, under the document library I mentioned before, there's a counselor recommendation form, and we're asking them to fill that out. Um, we're asking for, you know, maybe four or five sentences, a short paragraph. Then we're going to sit down with the kids one-on-one -on -one and go over them. Um, we're also asking for a resume. Uh, you guys are, can maybe submit your own formatted resume if you have copies. Otherwise, you can use the Naviance format. Um, we've been talking with the kids since the 10th grade about the resume, so they are aware of it. Um, the resume tool is under the About Me section. And it's right there under resume. Um, so we've been filling this out. And again, the kids have been seeing this since sophomore year. So there's a spot there where they can enter their work experience, volunteer experience, extracurriculars, clubs, athletics, and things like that. So in order to get as much information as possible about your student, um, over the past few years, we've started using a parent brag sheet. So this is a counselor recommendation form, the resume, and then now we're asking you guys, because who knows your kids better than you, um, to fill out a short questionnaire about your student, their qualities, um, their success, and then that way we're able to maybe add a little bit more information and insight into your student. Again, that's under the document library. Um, if you guys would turn to page six, we have our deadlines. So like I said, we write about 50 of these letters a year, and a lot of them we're doing within the next month. Um, so we do have very important deadlines that we adhere to, um, that we ask the students to turn them in, and that goes for counselor and teacher recommendation form. Um, so if you look on there, you're going to see it's 20 school days that we're asking to process these recommendations. Um, and as I mentioned, the same deadlines go for teachers. So there's a very small handful of kids that have an October 15 deadline, and that's usually the schools that are from s down south. Um, so don't worry, because we've already talked to those kids, um, and let them know that if they do have an October 15 deadline, we will be prioritizing them, and we will see them as soon as we're done with workshops on Monday. We are asking for those kids, though, to get their stuff in by Wednesday. And then the November 1 deadline, I think, is October 2nd. Um, so that's the other deadline that kind of comes up kind of quickly. And then you'll see we've got the November 15 and the December 1. Okay. So the last thing I'm going to cover that's in Naviance before we get into the Common App are the admissions counselor's visits. So last year, your students were able to go to five admissions counselor's visits. 
Um, details on how to sign up for these are on page eight. This year they have unlimited um, pending teacher approval. We already have a packed schedule of admissions counselors visits and we're encouraging the students to attend these sessions. Even if you've visited the schools with your child, it's important to build a rapport with these folks that are coming in. Oftentimes the people that come in are the people that are reading through the applications and then, you know, saying yay or nay on your student's admission. Um, so it's helpful to put a name with a face. This also goes for the college fair that we were talking about earlier, the September 18th. Even if the kids went last year, we're suggesting they go again this year, go up to that person that's at the Clark booth and say hello and shake hands. Um, to view the list, you're gonna click on colleges and then upcoming college visits. And then this list includes the college date and time. To sign up for a visit, you're gonna click sign up. So we're gonna go to Simmons. And then confirm by clicking sign me up. So we're asking students to check in with their teacher for permission uh, 24 hours in advance. Um, that way they give the teacher a heads up, make sure there's no test or anything, and that they can duck out for a couple minutes and go and say hello to the admissions counselor. The last thing we're asking is that the students print out the form in the document library I mentioned before, it's the college rep form, and they get the appropriate signatures, and then this is their pass to get in um, to the info session. All right, cool, I'm gonna pass it off to Dave Breglio, and he's gonna chat about the Common App. Thanks, everybody. We'll do uh, questions at the end, thank you. J Jason's gonna help me, we're gonna tag team the Common App. Um, so the Common App, w next week, um, your, your students will be in a workshop with us and we will be going over the Common App section by section. Um, so they should get a good feel of it. In this past workshop that we did with the students, we had them sign up for a Common App account. So a majority of our kids should have the Common App ready to go. After this week, a good chunk of the Common App should be completed um, as long as they're working hard in the workshop with us. If you look in the back of your packet, um, we have Common App tips back there. So if they're working on the Common App at home with you guys, each section of the Common App has a good tip um, associated with it. There's also uh, facts about the education section, um, some in good info in there that you need to have when you are implementing the education section. All right, so first thing we're gonna do on the Common App is we're gonna go to the college search. And so we're only gonna pick schools that we are 100% applying to. So right now we're gonna pick Babson and Assumption College. So we know these are two schools that will be getting applications from us. You type that school name right into the search bar and it'll pop up and then you can click add it. Okay, so now these schools will be on our list to apply. Um, part of this tab up top is there's a dashboard tab all the way to the left. This dashboard tab is a great tool just to stay organized. So it's going to have um, deadlines once we set them will show up on the dashboard. It's going to have, if there's a writing supplement attached to that application, um, it's going to give you um, clues to say have you completed different parts of the application yet. So if you look up here, there is a yellow dot. That means that pe the application is still pending. The writing um, supplement is still pending. If there is a red slash across it, that means the writing supplement is not required for that school. Um, if you complete the application, complete the writing supplement, you're gonna have a green check that shows up on um, the dashboard. Now there's a new section this year on the dashboard. It's called My College Requirements. This is another organizational tool that's gonna give you a lot of background info on the different applications available. So we see here it's gonna give you all the different deadlines and uh, that are offered through the school. So we look at assumption, they have an early um, decision and early action, and early action two with all the deadlines. They're gonna have the application fees listed. Um, Andrew, if you scroll over, they'll, they'll talk to you about if there is an essay required. Um, do they take the SATs? Do they want the SATs with essay? Um, so this is just a great tool to keep organized. Uh, it's brand new this year, and I think it's gonna be really useful for kids. So now we're gonna go back and we're gonna look at the actual Common App tab. 
And so we're going to go section by section through this just to give you some highlights on it. That first one is the profile. Part of the profile is going to have um, name, address, um, some demographic information. You want it's pretty straightforward. You want to go section by section, and you're looking to get a green check. Right? You get the green check on each tab. Once you're completed, all the way up to the left, you're going to have a green check under the profile, letting you know that you've completed everything they're asking you to do for that one section. Perfect. So my name's Jason, and I'm going to be talking about the family section of the common application. Uh, but before I do so, I just want to reiterate, so we will be meeting with the students next week, and we will be helping them fill out their common application. So a lot of this will be done, but the family section, the one I'm about to go over right now, is the one part where students will definitely need your help. Um, so in this section, they're going to need things like, as you can see, um, ask questions like marital status, it's going to go over your middle name, it's going to go over your maiden name, it's going to say where do you work, um, it's going to ask questions like where you went to college, and you'll have a little college lookup, you can literally type in assumption and put the college right in. So you'll need to help your students to kind of guide them through some of these answers. Okay, so this is the one section we really ask that you kind of sit with your student and go through them with this. On the next tab, we're going to go to the education tab. And if everyone can please look at page three on that successfully completing the Common App document that you're on. So it's actually the very end of that workbook. Um, this is where you're going to enter specific information about Algonquin, including uh, things about attendance, um, dates of attendance, GPA, rank, senior year courses, counselor contact information. Um, and we gave very detailed instructions in the handout that you have now, but we also gave this to the students earlier, and we told them all of them it was crucial for the application process, so they all have it saved in their folders. So the first thing I'm going to talk about quickly because um, as you can see when you go through it's going to ask questions like your counselor's middle initial, their email, their extension. So all of that is included on that page. But if we go down a little bit and we click on grades, this part's important. So the graduating class size is actually 343. Um, the rank is going to be reported as exact and we use a weighting scale as far as the rank. And then they're going to enter their GPA in. The scale is on a five scale, and we use a weighted scale for GPA. And then for the next part, current continue. So current or most recent year courses. So the students, they might want another copy of the schedule, or they might want to make sure they know what they're taking next semester when they fill this out. So colleges will see this. So we tell them when they put their classes in here, they have to remember that their colleges that they're applying to will see this. So that means that if next semester they decide they no longer want to be in their English honors course, they want to switch to maybe CP or a different course, they'll have to let their colleges know because they already reported that they were going to be in that course next semester and this is where they do it. So essentially they're sending their entire schedule and putting it on the application. So we're going to report seven courses, and all of our courses are in a semester um, schedule. So we use semester. It's going to give you a couple different options. We can click it and see. So there's semester, trimester, and quarter. So we use semester. They're always going to click on that. And then we ask that they rank the courses in order of rigor. Now, if they have questions about that, they can always come and see us. So if they're in an AP course, for example, that would be at the top of the list. So this student here is in AP Psychology. So they title the course Psychology, and then they'll click on AP, and then the course one schedule, it's a full year course. Now, the next class we have is Pre-Calculus. Looks as though it's Honors, and that's going to be a full year course as well. Now next, they have Creative Writing. Looks like it's an Honors course, but this is a half year course. So we can say this is the first semester. This is what they're currently in right now. And then we have Silence Voices. Uh, this appears to be a CP course. So if it's not honors and if it's not AP, it would be CP. And there's no button for CP, so you simply leave it blank. 
And then um, we'll pick, click on it, and it's going to be second semester. So they're taking this course next semester again. So if they're taking this course next semester and they want to change it later on, they'll have to notify their colleges. So they want to make sure they're set with their schedule for the full year before they start reporting all their, all their course courses for their colleges. And then period, it looks like we have physiology, CP, that's a full year course. And then we have health and fitness 12, that's CP, and we can say that's second semester. They want to make sure they put all their courses in again, and when they do so, um, so we can, yeah, continue. When they do so, just to show very quickly, oh, if you hit preview, they can see this is what the admissions counselors would get a glance at. You can see how the schedule appears right there. So we have AP Psychology on top, we have Pre-Calc Honors, Physiology, Creative Writing Honors. So you can see they look right at the top and they look down. So they see the most rigorous courses right at the top and scroll down. So that's how we want it to appear. <clears throat> All right, so next up is the testing tab. So this is a chance for students to self-report their test scores. So the test scores they're going to have the chance to self-report would be the, an ACT test, an SAT, te SAT test, um, a subject test, um, AP test that they took in the past. Um, so Andrew, if you go down, there should be an SAT that you could click on for an example. Next one. There you go. So here's an example of a filled out SAT that the student's taken. Um, so you have the chance to self-report your scores. You're going to tell them the highest score you got, the test date that you took that score. You have the chance to tell them how many times you took that SAT. Are you planning to take a future SAT? So if you list that, yes, you will be taking one more sitting on the SAT, then that school could possibly be waiting on another round of test scores that you may be sending to them. Um, here, um, you're going to have the, the math score, the reading score, the writing score, the dates associated with those highest scores. Um, what we, and this is where kids get trip, tripped up all the time. When they forget to send their SATs or their ACTs to the college, they always say, well, I self-reported it on the Common App, right? That's your self-report. You could list that you got a 1600, and that's an awesome score to send to a college, but you have to verify it through College Board, verify it through the ACT um, account. So, if you are uh, self-reporting your test scores, and we recommend that you do on the Common App, make sure that you are sending the actual scores through the testing company as well, okay? So the, the actual score report through the testing company along with the self-reported scores, very important to do. Um, you also have the opportunity to put AP scores in if you have them from your junior year. Um, we are gonna look at the activities tab now. Here you have the chance to list 10 activities that your student has been involved with throughout high school. So they don't have to be just activities that you were involved with inside of the high school. We could have students list anything from part-time jobs, um, things they've done with their youth group, sports they've been involved with, um, any musicals or clubs that they've been um, a leader in or just participated in. A lot of times I'll have kids come down, we're going through the Common App together, and I see they only list one or two different activities. After a five or six minute conversation we have together, we have three or four more activities that are really good for the college to know about. So this is a section where if you sit down with your students, sometimes they have a hard time talking about themselves, reflecting on the last four years. You sit down with them, find a way to add a couple extra activities. You don't have to get to 10, but you want to fill this section up if you have some pertinent information you can give to the schools. Um, the way we ask kids to organize this is, you want to list your first choice act or the number one activity as the activity that meant most to you in high school. So if you've been a captain of the lacrosse team for two years and lacrosse is your passion, you want to play in college, maybe list that as number one. If you have had a part-time job and you've moved up through the ranks at Wegmans and now you're an assistant manager as an 18-year-old, that's awesome for the colleges to know about, maybe you list that as number one. But you really want to think what was the most important to you and try to rank those activities as you're listing them on the Common App. If you are ranking activities and you know a kid has a change of heart and he thinks, you know what, maybe um, my fourth or fifth place activity was actually more meaningful than I originally thought it was, you can move the activities up and down the list with just an arrow. You don't have to erase everything and start over again. So you can slide things up and down without having to erase them. So 
now we're going to move to the writing section of the Common App. Um, so last May we had a workshop where we talked to juniors and parents about what to do over the summer. And at that time we handed out a workbook which included the Common App essay prompts. So I'm sure one of the things we asked was students review those prompts and start brainstorming ideas and start their rough draft. So hopefully everybody had a rough draft good to go at the beginning of the school year. Um, but what we're going to go through now is we're going to show how to put that essay into the application. So they have to select the prompt that they're choosing. So they have to make sure they click the right prompt. And then they're going to copy and paste the essay into this box. Now, one thing that's crucial is that they look at it when they copy and paste it in. Because if they're using a Mac or if they're using a certain Word document, it might not copy and paste correctly and there might be periods missing or punctuation missing. So they want to make sure that it looks 100% accurate. It only takes a few seconds, but they want to make sure that it's right. So the, keep in mind, the personal essay will be submitted to every college on the list. Okay, So students, um, again, will have to select the prompt. They have a maximum of 650 words. So if their Word document was 660 words, when they copy and paste that, it's just going to cut it off right at the end. So again, they have to make sure it looks correct when they go in there. So a good rule of thumb, again, is to scroll to the top, click that preview button, and now they can see exactly what their essay looks like. Okay? So they're going to want to do that because that's what the admissions rep will see. So another thing is a lot of students are working on the college essay with their English teachers, maybe right now in class. So we encourage students um, to have their English teacher look at these essays. I don't know if everyone knows this or not, but we actually have a writing center available here at Algonquin, and they could bring those essays to the writing center as well. They can schedule an appointment and have someone look at their college essay. Um, and obviously at any time they can ask us for advice too. Um, we might not all be the best at grammar, that would be the English teacher, but they can come down and we can go over the content and discuss the essay with them. If we go back to the essay and scroll towards the bottom, you'll see a tab and it says disciplinary history. So students must report any suspensions, any felonies or misdemeanors as well. So if this applies to their child, they will have an opportunity right here to write in a s statement about what happened. So they need to do this because we also need to report it. So if the student has been suspended, we are going to report it. So if we report it and then they do not, that will not look good. So make sure that they have a discussion with their counselor. If they know they've been suspended, they should come down and they should talk to their counselor and we can kind of talk about what uh, will be written in that section. So beyond that, if you look at the bottom, it says additional information. So this gives students an opportunity to provide some additional information around maybe a special circumstance or qualifications that are not mentioned anywhere else in the application. This isn't the opportunity to write another essay it's just a quick opportunity for the student to say like a couple sentences on a special circumstance. For example, like let's say the student received a concussion while participating in athletics. So they can say how it, that concussion impacted their term three and four grades during their sophomore year. And the college will know that. It's just short and sweet. Okay, so we have, hopefully we have green checks on every single tab under the Common App and we're ready to go to the next section. So we would go to my colleges. Now this is a chance where you're gonna answer some individual questions pertaining to the schools you're applying to. So first up for Assumption College, we're gonna click on the Recommenders tab. So here we've already done the FERPA that Connor talked about a little while ago. Um, and then there's a tab that say to invite recommenders. So they do not have to invite recommenders for teachers or for guidance counselors. We will submit all our stuff through Naviance, okay? Below that is that advisor um, invitation that Lisa mentioned early on. So just to reiterate, we will be meeting with your students if they want us to review Common App with them. They should just reach out to us, set up an appointment. We will 100% review the Common App 
but we do not want them sending us a link through the advisor tab, okay? Below you'll see counselor and teacher recommendations. Like I said, that will be going through Naviance. They do not have to invite us on the Common App, but all the way to the bottom, there is an other recommender tab. You see here that Assumption will take two outside recommend recommenders. That means people that do not work inside the school system. So that could be a boss. That could be a coach that um, the students played for for a couple years. That could be their leader of their youth group that knows them really well. Not every single college will take an outside recommender, but if you do have a recommendation that is from a non-teacher and non-counselor that's coming from outside Algonquin, this is the way that you can invite them to upload that application to that college. All right, so now we've looked through the recommenders. Now we're gonna answer some individual call questions on that college. So you click on the questions tab. It's gonna ask you a couple easy things. When do you prefer to start? So obviously if you're gonna be applying for the fall of 2018, you wanna make sure you have that down right. They're gonna ask you the admissions plan. So on the dashboard where it had a blank space, if we picked early action, now it's gonna show us the deadline on the, on the dashboard when we click back there. It's gonna ask you, do you wanna live on campus? Will you be a commuter student? Preferred testing plan, so not every school is gonna offer this, but if a school is SAT or ACT optional, they may ask you, do you want to have your test scores submitted and as part of your application package? So if you have a fantastic GPA, you have sparkling recommendation letters, you've been involved with a ton of clubs and sports, but you just did not do very well on the test or you're not confident with your SAT or ACT scores, you don't want assumption to consider them, they wanna just go off your GPA and the, the rest of your application package, you can click here not to consider your test scores and they will not be sent, they will not be self-reported on the Common App um, with that earlier tab we looked at. Once you go through all these sections and you hit continue, so there's gonna be a few more academics, what you wanna study, um, do you have any family member that's ever worked at Assumption? Pretty easy questions. This section should go pretty fast for the students. Um, they may have a separate writing section at the bottom. Please explain in a few sentences your answer to the question, who or what influenced you to apply to Assumption College? 125 words or fewer. The student really still wants to uh, spend some time on this. Um, they don't have to go crazy writing a three paragraph long answer, but they want to provide a thoughtful answer to this question. They put that down and they hit continue. They have a green check under every tab. Now they're ready to apply. So on the left hand side, it says review and submit. Here it's gonna, if you don't have every section completed, it will not let you move forward with the application. But if you do have all the green checks where they need to be, they're gonna let you pull up a PDF of the, of the application. You can go through every section one last time, find that last minute typos, change an answer if you need to. Then you can move forward, pay for the application, and submit it. So uh, I'm going to look at Babs Babson College. So we'll click on Babson. So as you notice, they actually have their questions as part of their application. But below that, they also have writing supplement. So before I go into that, I just want to say one thing. The Common App tab at the top, that goes to every single school. That's a common application that goes to every school. When we click on Babson or Assumption, that is specific towards that one institution. The only one seeing the answers to these questions is Babson College. So under um, the questions, under the application, we're actually going to go in and we're going to say our preferred start time is the fall. We're going to say our admissions plan. We're going to go early decision. So again, early decision is binding. They can only apply to one school early decision. And if they get in, they are going to that institution. So since it's binding, they have to scroll to the bottom, and now they have to agree to the early decision terms. They have to check yes, and they actually have to type in their name as well. So they would type in their name and hit continue. So Crystal Ball will put her name in and then continue. But now she's still not done with the early decision process. So she actually has to go and click on Recommenders and FERPA, and she's going to have to scroll down, I think, and see here it says parent. As an ED applicant, you must invite a parent. So the parent also has to sign and agree to the ED. So they have to click on invite parent, and they'll have to read through this, and then put in your email. 
so you can see, I'll, oh, we're going through the FERPA. So essentially they'll have to put in your email account, invite you, you'll get an email saying you have to sign in and you have to agree to the ED decision as well. They also have to let their guidance counselor know as well and we have to go in and sign something saying that we know they're applying ED. So again, this is only for ED candidates, but I just want to cover it quickly. So we'll go down now and there's the writing supplement. So this is an addition to the regular application. So this school specifically asks that they write either a 500 word max essay or they film a one minute video on YouTube and upload the video. It's their choice, whatever they feel comfortable doing. All right. One of the biggest things I see with my students is they finish the Common App, they feel good, they think they're pretty much done, but they don't look through their schools and see what the supplements are. So now, it might be a week before the applications are due and they're ready to submit and they go in there and say, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I have to write a 500 word essay for Babson and I didn't realize that Assumption College needed a two minute video and I didn't know that Clark needed a 750 word essay on this. Now they have to get all this together right before their applications. So I always tell students, once your schools are up there, take a look at what those writing supplements are, but also the questions in the application. When Dave went through Assumption, one of the questions, I believe, was a fairly significant writing section that they have to do. So sometimes they sneak a little bit of writing in the questions as well at the top. So once they finish their writing supplement, there are two sections. Dave reviewed and submit under the application. But for us, let's say we're done with the writing supplement, we would review and submit the writing supplement and that part would be complete. That does not mean your application is complete and done. That just means you've submitted the writing, the writing supplement part. They still have to go into the part above where it says application and make sure those questions, the common app, and that section is submitted as well. So that must be completed. So what we'll do quickly just to end the common app is click on the dashboard. And what would happen is if they finish the Assumption College application, that yellow dot would turn into a nice green check and they would know they're done. If Babson, they finish the writing supplement, that would be a green check. But they'll, again, they'll need to have two green checks for Babson College, one on the application and one on the writing supplement. And now Kate is going to talk about financial aid. All right, so I'm just going to briefly go over financial aid. Um, I know Lisa mentioned that um, there will be a MIFA counselor here during our financial aid night on September 27th, starting at 7 p.m. Um, so that person is an expert at financial aid, and I by no means am an expert at financial aid. Um, so in the workbook, there is a page that goes over financial aid. There are three ma main sources of financial aid. So there's grants and scholarships. This is essentially free money. Um, it does not need to be repaid. Grants are offered by the federal and state government, as well as by some institutions. Grants could be merit-based, need-based, or student-specific. Uh, while scholarships are typically offered by individual institutions and private organizations and can be awarded on a number of things like academic performance, athletic ability, religious affiliation, or a number of other things. Uh, the next source of financial aid is no one's favorite, the loan. Um, so there are parent and student loans, and these can be obtained through the federal government or through private lenders. Obviously, these have to be repaid um, with some interest as well. And finally, um, another main source is the work study. So this is a federal or institutional program that allows students to work while they're in college. Um, often students will work for the school, and the student will earn at least um, the federal minimum wage but the total work study award depends on when the student applies, the level of financial need, and also the school's funding. So the student will get paid directly um, in a typical paycheck unless otherwise requested. So a student can request for this to go directly towards their tuition or their housing. Um, but if they do not make this request to the school or university, um, they will get paid directly in a paycheck uh, made out to them. So how do you get financial aid? Um, there are three types of forms. The first is the FAFSA. So this is the free application for federal student aid. Everyone needs to fill this out if they want any type of aid, including grants and scholarships in most cases. So the FAFSA is based upon your income um, for the most part. For the 2018-19 school year, 
you can start applying October 1st of this year. Um, you don't have to start on October 1st. However, the earlier you um, apply, there uh, may be some federal student aid programs that have limited funds. So the sooner you apply, sometimes the better. Um, you can also check the college's deadlines. Uh, so although you can start filling out the FAFSA October 1st, most colleges' deadlines are sometime in January, February, or sometimes even March. So as you're applying and your student's making their list, go on and check each college and when their um, uh, financial aid deadline is. So in the meantime, you can always file for an, F um, an FSA ID. So the parents and students need their own ID. Um, through FAFSA, you will figure out your family's EFC, which is the estimated family contribution. So schools typically try to fill the gap between what you are expected to pay and the actual cost of attending. So the EFC and then the cost of attending, they try to fill that gap. Um, there's also the CSS profile. So this is used by many private colleges and universities. It looks at both your income as well as, well as your assets, so homes, cars, boats, anything like that. This form is used by colleges to distribute their own funds. Um, and this form can be found on collegeboard.com. And this form can be completed anytime. Um, so also, if you go onto College Board, it lists which schools require the CSS profile. Um, but I always suggest going onto each school's website and finding out what they specifically require for their financial um, aid needs. And there's also some colleges that have their own personal forms. Um, it could be included in the application packet or it could be mailed to you after the student applies. Again, log on to each college's financial aid website and just figure out what exactly they require um, because you want to make sure that you have everything in so your student um, can obtain some financial aid. Um, financial aid is always changing and it's very complex. This is just a brief overview. Um, so again, please attend the financial aid night um, with the MIFA representative. Um, you can also log on to MIFA.org for any other assistance and they can go into more in-depth about specific financial aid needs on there as well. Lastly, um, we do have a scholarship list on Naviance um, and after winter break is when most of the local scholarships start up. Um, so most are due in early spring, some have earlier deadlines, maybe sometimes in January or February. Um, so students should start to look at the Naviance scholarship list um, when we come back from the winter break in December. Um, so keep checking it. We're always adding in new scholarships. Um, so, you know, check weekly at least. Um, and if there's, you know, your student fits some of the criteria or all of it, we say go ahead and apply. Um, this could be merit-based, so some students have to submit a transcript. Um, some of them will require essays. So again, the more often that you look, the more time the student has to write that essay as well. And also in your workbook, there is a list of national scholarships, um, the websites for those. Again, you're applying against everyone nationally, um, so they're a little bit harder to obtain sometimes, which is why the list on Naviance of the regional scholarships is so great. Um, you know, less competition, uh, which is always a nice thing. All right, so that's my quick financial aid overview. Um, and Becca Haberman is next to kind of wrap things up and tie up the loose ends. All right, they told me to not make you guys laugh or anything because we got to get out of here for the Pats game. But real quick, how many of you, this is the first child that's going through this? Oh, look at that. So your stress level right now is way up here, right? Part of this, we're giving you guys a whole lot of information. We are available. If you have questions, always feel free to email us. We actually will even meet with you and your child. We do try and we will start meeting individually with your kids um, right after we finish this round of uh, workshops. So one of the big things, do you want to bring that up, is who is responsible for what? And we actually, your students in the workshops this week all got really nice colored folders. We're trying to keep them organized. And in that, there's the workbooks as well as a bunch of other information to help them through this process. But what we went over with the kids today is what they're responsible for, 
what we're responsible for, and what their teacher is responsible for. So as I said to the students, they are responsible for the application. If they don't fill out the application, then they won't get into the college that they want to apply to. Or if they fill out the application and the deadline is January 1st and they wait till January 5th to send that application, they will not get into that college. So one of the things that you can help your child with is prioritizing and making sure that they are meeting their own deadlines. Um, we've talked a lot about how we will go over their application with them. I always tell our students, you know what, I'd like to see what your first application before you send it off, just to make sure you spelled your name right, your birthday is right. Um, but if you're coming to me the morning of November 1st and you've got a November 1st deadline, I might be out sick. I might not be available. So you got to give enough time in order for us to help them. So um, they are responsible for application. They or you are responsible for application fees. Each college have different fees. Some there's no fee. Some it's 25. I think some are 60. I don't know if they're any higher than that. Um, you saw supplements. So again, they're responsible for that. They're responsible for essays. We are always willing to read over essays for the kids. But again, they got to give us time to do that. Um, the big thing, as Andrea talked about, is they are responsible for sending test scores. And that is the one thing that always gets forgotten to send. So again, make sure that they are sending that. And you got to pay to send those too. Um, transcript fees, after they put down which schools they're applying to, they don't have to rush down tomorrow to give us transcript fees because we haven't sent, sent out anything yet. But you know, after they're all done with applying, they need to see us and pay their transcript fees. Some kids will have to do a portfolio if they're applying to an art school or architecture or something. And sometimes a college will say, hey, send us a resume. Um, so that's all the pieces that they are responsible for. What we are responsible for is, first off, sending out their transcript. The college wants to see the transcript. What is on the transcript is not only their final grades from freshman, sophomore, and junior year, but also the classes they are taking this year. And that's important, as I think Connor said, somebody said that in their schedule, if they have signed up, say, for sociology second semester, and then they decide, you know what? I uh, got into a couple of colleges. I don't want to take sociology anymore. We will not drop that class. They need to first call the colleges that they've been accepted to, call the colleges that they are applying to, and make sure it's OK for them to drop that. Once we get a note from them and from you that it's OK, then we would drop it. But they got to talk to the colleges. So we will be telling them that on Monday. Um, let's see, we also. We send something called a school profile, so when you see that, don't worry about that. That's something we take care of. Um, we will send out their first quarter grades in November after the grades close. We will be asking the students to double check their report cards, make sure they're right before we send those out. Oftentimes, we do send out the mid-year grades in, I don't know, February? early February. So again, the colleges are going to want to see those grades. And then at the end, we'll send out their final transcript to the college that they're going to. And we do tell the kids that that final transcript better look like what they've been doing. Unfortunately, every year we get a kid or two who has decided to have senioritis way too early, and their transcript does not look like what they applied for. So then the college might say, yeah, we accepted you, but it's a conditional acceptance based on what you said you were going to do grade-wise. So if all of a sudden they're failing everything, that college will say, no, thank you. Or they might take them on a probation period. 
uh, we send out our counselor recommendation form and a secondary school report. The teachers, they take care of their bit. Everything's through Naviance. We've showed the kids how to invite a teacher on Naviance so that they can send out their recommendation. As long as they follow our deadlines, and that's the important piece, is they have their college deadline, but then they also have the recommendation deadline. And I tell them, they can give me my stuff now. That's okay. They don't have to wait till the deadline. Um, so that's really who sends what. The only other bit, and we learned this as we started talking to colleges last year, is once a student applies, the college likes to see them go on. They have to open up a portal or something so that the college tells them where their application is at and everything. But they also sort of track that interest level. So while we say go out, visit schools, meet with admissions counselors, come here, see the counselors that are coming in to visit, they also keep track a bit of what the student is looking at on their website, if they're um, joining a group, if they are answering their emails. So we tell the kids, once you've applied, you've got to also continue looking at that school because that could help them. I think that's it. So now we um, can take questions. I know you had some questions. Everybody can hear your question. Wonderful. Hi. Um, I know they could take the, say they take the SAT up to three times. You don't necessarily want the college to see all three SAT scores. What we did for my son last year at a different school is that we chose, he chose one testing date to send because it was like the best one. And you, that's kind of not exactly what you said, so I just wanted some clarity about that. No, actually, what I always say, and a lot of schools really sort of uh, say don't do that, that score choice, because what the school's going to do is they're going to take the best score. So let's say you've taken the test three times, and in June last year, in your critical reading or whatever that is, you've scored a 600. In October, you score a 500. They're going to take that 600 from June. They're going to take the best math score, which could be from October, and combine those. So the colleges are always going to look at the best scores. They're not going to say, well, you know what? Joey only scored a 400, but then the next time he scored 500, well, he must have done something right. So they will always take the best scores because for them, it's better for their reporting purposes because they are always reporting their average SAT or ACT scores. So I tend to not do score choice. I say send them all. But then, and you pay, then you're paying fees for all three ones that you're sending as well. No, correct? on college board, they send the whole report. The difference is ACTs will only send one score. So let's say your child took the ACT in June and they're taking it again in October. ACT, unlike College Board, College Board sends a whole score report with all your scores on it. ACT asks you to pick which score to send. So let's say you take it in June, you score a 25. You take it in October, you score a 26. Now, you're probably going to then just send the October score. However, some schools, and not all the schools, some schools might super score certain pieces of the ACT. So that, that's where you and your student have to become kind of experts on the colleges that you're applying to because you gotta let, you got to figure out what they want. Some schools don't want any testing, which is perfect for somebody like me. Uh, other questions? Some parts of the ACT, sometimes a college will super score, so they might take the highest 
science section from various settings. Unlike the SAT, which puts everything in one score report, you'd have to pay to have both scores sent. Because they're all nonprofits, so they're not making any money on this crap. Quick question. Um, to get AP scores, do we ask that through the College Board too? The AP scores will only be sent to the college that your student is going to. Your student will self-report APs that they took last year, maybe they took AP US History sophomore year. Colleges do not figure in AP scores through their admittance. They will use the AP scores to the school you're going to to determine whether or not, and again, each college is different, whether or not you would have to take that intro to bio, or what kind of credit you would get. So that your student would be doing in May when they're taking the APs this year. Uh, one of the schools my daughter is applying to self-reports the grades. So how do we get a copy of the transcript? Do we just request it from our counselor? Yep, all you do. So there are a lot of schools, all the California, the UC schools and stuff, we're not sending recommendations, we're not sending transcripts. They don't even have to request a transcript right now from us. So a lot of schools will have the student self-report. All of your student needs to do is ask us for an unofficial transcript. And again, sometimes that stuff is a little, um, it can be a little confusing, so that's where if they have questions, we can go through it with them. For the teacher recommendations, there was a, a button to select a specific college. Uh, are we asking for six or eight letters from the teachers? No, that, that's a great question actually. So when your student goes on and requests their teacher to send their recommendation, there's two prompts. One is to just send to specific colleges the other is to send to all the colleges what's listed now and what's added. For the most part, I tell the students, just put down, you want their recommendations sent everywhere. Occasionally, we have some students who might be applying, say to like a WPI, which wants a math and science teacher, but they've also been involved with music, so they want an extra recommendation from Miss Collins because they've been doing uh, wind ensemble with her. That's where then they would just have Miss Collins send to WPI. But for the most part, colleges typically only want one or two teacher recommendations. Um, most of the time, just one. And again, this is where you guys become the experts on the colleges that your students apply into. More is not only, it, it, sometimes sending less is better to the colleges because if they're getting five recommendations, everything's saying, Billy's wonderful, he's a really nice boy, he tries hard, they're not gonna pay attention to that. Having a couple of recommendations that really talk about your student, what he's like in the classroom, and then we talk about them as an overall community member. So yes, for, um, have them send to all the colleges. Yeah, we moved here about two and a half years ago from out of state. How will that impact transcripts and ranking and all those other things? So for people who've moved who have not been at Algonquin the whole time, your date of entry at Algonquin will be different than what we have on the list. And again, we'll meet with your students individually about that. We send the whole transcript, so when somebody moves, we actually input the transcript from that other school, we mark it, so, you know, somebody came from, um, I don't know, John High School, it will show John High School, it will show all of their grades there, so you don't have to contact your other schools for those grades. Um, 
This is our third child, so I'm I know used that. to the. I'm, but I'm used to the stamped envelopes that we had. To yeah, give. we got rid of those a long time ago. <laughs> now, why is that listed then? Address stamped envelope provided by the student for the teacher. Is so the only time you'd have to provide an envelope to a teacher is if you are applying if to a school that does not take electronic. Um, University of Guam is one. Okay, um, so yeah, and a lot of times just have your student talk to us. Um, yeah, there's no more envelopes. It's yes, we're not stuffing envelopes. We're Thank just God. clicking buttons. Um, yeah, we ran into a bunch of schools that use the coalition app. How does that tie in with Naviance? <laughs> um, so the coalition application, we would just, you'll just indicate when you go in, like when, the, when you transfer um, your schools over, it asks the kids how they're applying to the school, okay? So when they, when they request a transcript and they, they um, send it over, it asks them how they're going to be applying to the school, okay? So they'll indicate that they're not utilizing the Common App, all right? And um, that should allow us to send electronically to those schools, correct? you want to add something back? I do. Um, just a lot of the coalition schools also use the Common App. At this point, I would use the Common App. Hi. <laughs> Me again. Um, would you recommend that we um, go in the application for the particular school and kind of work on it and then save it and come back to it? Because one of the things that stuck, I didn't do that with my son, we just kind of just did it and then sent it. But one of the things that came up on one of the examples the teacher showed was um, uh, about inviting outside recommendations. And so obviously you need to know that ahead of time. So how do you know if your school wants outside recommendations? Does that, that make sense? That would show on the Common App based on that school. So let's say assumption might, under the question part in assumption, mm -hmm. and under that recommender part that's just for assumption, they, that would let you know whether or not, so that recommender, that would only be going to assumption or any other schools that allow that extra so recommendation. So this kind of like a face sheet? before you totally get into every question, so you'd know, is that? Well, I always say fill out your basic Common App first, yeah. and, but understand what all your questions are on each school. That's why I always say so get a manageable list of okay. school, and you can always okay. save. Yeah. And you can also um, just submit the Common App to a couple of schools. You don't have to do it to every single school all at once. Now, what I do tell kids is, let's say you are applying, you know that there are six schools that you want to apply to, you're not applying to early decision anywhere, and you are all set, you've answered all the questions and everything, but some of your applications aren't to due till January 1st, but you're done November 15th, send it. Get it off your shoulders. So a simple answer is yes. You can open up an application, you can start it, and you can save it, and you can come back to it. And I think that's a good practice because, you know, oftentimes if you've spent like an hour working on an application, you start maybe getting a little tired because it's been a long day, I think it's good to save it, step away from it, come back to it with fresh eyes, right, just to make sure that you don't have any typos or you haven't made any errors on the, you know, application. Yes, they, on the Common App, yes, under each school. Um, if, if a student um, really likes a certain school, does it look better to apply directly to the school or the Common App? Um, is it fine? Does it look any different in the college's eyes? No, if the school takes the Common App, they accept the Common App. I think it makes it easier for stu for a student if you know if their school is accepting the Common App. They have four of them; they can just fill it out for all four schools. If the college didn't feel like they were getting the information that they needed in order to assess the student as a candidate, then they wouldn't subscribe to the Common App. Does that make sense? So it's fine to do the Common App. 
streamlines things, I think, for the kids. So there's no, you can send your application as early as you want? If Absolutely. If, if you have it all filled out, which I wouldn't, because unless you don't even know your class rank yet. So yes, you can. Once it's done, once you've had, once your child has had your eyes on it, and at least your guidance counselor has looked at one of the common app, get rid of it. Go. So the class rank, uh, so that's at the end of junior year, that doesn't change, or it does? Like, what, do they take into account the senior? I mean, you said, um, at the end of the junior year that that's what their GPA is? That's what their GPA and their class rank will be reported to the colleges. Okay. So we will not recalculate the GPA and issue a new rank until after they've graduated. However, the colleges will look at term one and term two grades and they will factor that into their overall decision that they're making about the student. But it won't change rank. Well, our, rank, our, class, our GPA and our rank is only based off final grades. So it's not based off of turn grades. So recalculating that would be an inaccurate you know, calculation. So we do not go in and recalculate um, until the end of the year. Okay. One of the speakers earlier said that uh, early decision was binding. Uh, but I was under the impression that um, if you felt the financial aid offer was insufficient, then you could refuse the early decision. You can. However, you go into early decision typically knowing that you know, you're going to give them your financial aid information, see what it is. Um, so you can back out of early decision. Those other schools that might also be ED, may actually know that you backed out because admissions reps talk to each other. So if you are worried about financial aid or something, then I say don't go ED. You don't have to. And one of the things that they'll talk about at the financial aid office, and I, uh, at the financial aid night, and I think that in the spring, Connor might have meant, talked about the net price calculator. So you can go on to the college's website and you can put some information in, you know, and they'll get through the net price calculator and they'll give you an idea of, you know, what it might cost to attend the school. So I think that will kind of give you a ballpark. So as you're making that decision, you know, do we think we can afford, you know, to commit to this school? Um, that might help you in that decision making process. And, you know, the MIFA rep will talk a little bit more about that at the financial aid night. Just a cl clarification, um, you provide a schedule of when the student should um, be asking the guidance counselor for recommendations by depending on um, the college application deadlines. So if you're, uh, the student's applying to multiple, most are November 1st, some are January 1st or 15th, you want us to do a rolling ask? No. Or, or we can just tell you once, here's a whole schedule of all the colleges, when they're due and So what she's asking is we have the deadlines, the counselor deadlines versus the college application deadlines in the workbook. And she's asking, do you have, do the students have to update us every time they go to submit an application? So if they have a November 1st, you know, deadline and they've submitted their materials to us, do they then have to come back for a December 15th deadline to request that their um, that their letter be sent again? So the answer to that is no. Okay, so we go off the first deadline. So if a student has a November 1st deadline, then they submit their counselor recommendation materials to us along with the parent brag sheet and the resume. We then craft our letter and we send out the first round of transcripts and letters to those early um, schools. After that, they can go in and they can request transcripts. Okay, so if they add a school to their list, they, they um, request a transcript, 
our secretary goes in on a regular basis and looks for new um, transcript requests and she submits those for us. So once our letter is in there, we can go ahead and just submit them. So how it triggers to us that a student has, you know, requested more materials is through the transcript request. Okay, and the counselor rec will automatically go along with that once we've sent one school in. Hi. You mentioned the UC schools earlier having their own system. So just to cause you guys as much grief as possible, my son's applying to uh, UCLA. Uh, University of Texas has their own system. Um, he's got a handful of schools on the Common App, a couple schools on the Coalition App. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, it's it got about five or six different systems. He's um, going to have a lot of fun. We're done. I've got 12 apps waiting to go, waiting on... Waiting on um, the uh, council recommendations and uh, teacher recommendations. So we, we spent the summer doing that. Um, but with all, with all that said, um, how do, you know, are, are his teachers going to have to upload to five or six or seven literally different systems uh, to get those recommendations in? Like, like, for example, UT, we've got that done. We're waiting for the transcripts and the recommendations. Um, Correct. So UT's hooked into Navion's through eDocs electronically, it just goes all through Naviance. It has a stamp on the symbol. Then you want to check, so if it has a stamp, number one, you want to check, do they actually want recommendations? And if they do, then he's got to provide an envelope to his teacher addressed to UT. UT has a specific upload system that they use, and, and I sent requests to everyone electronically then, to use their upload system, but I believe UCLA has a separate upload system. All these ones do. That's yep. Then they would submit directly so to UT through their so, site. So they would have to do it like five or six times? Yeah. Okay. Once the letter's written, it's not that difficult. It beats stuffing envelopes, that's for sure. Hi, I'm just wondering when you want that parent brag sheet in, like the latest. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your child's first deadline? <laughs> Good, yeah, so whatever the deadline is for the first deadline <laughs> to us. So like, what, October 2nd for a November 1st? So no later than then, okay? Yeah, because once we start getting things from the kids, we start writing. I have gotten parent brag sheets after I've already sent my stuff, so those parents wasted their time because it was no use to me. So that's something I would do sooner. If you want to do it, you don't have to do it. It does help us. Um, but if you're going to do it, I would do it sooner rather than later. It doesn't have to be a book. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? OK, go Pats. All right, thank you for coming. Have a nice night.